uh, Anand's area of specialization is modern India. He is a Commonwealth scholar at St. Catherine's College, uh, he was at St. Catherine's College in Cambridge. And his thesis is titled The Creation of the Religious Identities in the Punjab, Sutra 83 to 1920. His last professorial assignment was at Azul Saint Hindu University in Bengaluru. He has taught students of varying social backgrounds, ranging from middle school all the way up to PhD. Um, it is with uh, great uh, pleasure that he has, uh, you know, that I announce that he has uh, come to give us a lecture on, and the lecture title, as you know, uh, is um, the partition, the three, three parts to the partition of India and of British India, actually. And it is uh, going to be on uh, political parties, brutality, mentality. Without much ado, I ask Anil to start his lecture. So, uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Sharina, for a generous, warm introduction. Uh, I have uh, always considered uh, that I'm a part of Deshbandhu College. Uh, is that okay? So, I feel very much a part of Deshbandhu College, having uh, joined here as a teacher at the age of 23. And the chokidar outside would stop me and say, you're a student, you can't get in, show me your eye card. So uh, I've spent long years here. Uh, finally left in 2005. And as Sherina said, I've learned a lot from both my students and colleagues here. So uh, I'm very happy to have come back and I'm happy to be doing this talk on three parts to partition, party politics, brutality, and mentality. Uh, at the outset, I should say that this is a talk meant for students, because that is how Sherina had uh, arranged it, that uh, our literature students must be able to understand certain aspects of the partition. So it'll be uh, targeted at students, but I do hope that uh, the senior members of the college will gain something perhaps, and it may provide uh, some occasion for interesting questions, debates, discussions. Uh, I should speak for about 15 minutes, and uh, my purpose today is uh, not to deal with any one aspect of the partition in detail. And as you know, today we have a partition industry, really. There's so much work done on the partition of India, and so many aspects have been covered. Uh, I could spend hours talking only about the tortuous negotiations for independence and partition that took place between the principal political parties. Uh, that is a very big subject and also a subject where students today are less knowledgeable than they are perhaps about the experiences of the partition, about the violence of the partition and the brutality of the partition. It's very sad that they know very little about the high politics of partition, which I think is uh, connected at some level with other aspects of this very cataclysmic event. So <clears throat> I could, I think, let Bajrang settle down. I think uh, I could spend a long time on just the party politics, on the negotiations for uh, independence and partition. And likewise, one can spend a long time on the experiences of the people during the partition, the genocide that happened. Uh, but my purpose is not to dwell on one or the other, or perhaps even rehabilitation, but to look at the interrelationships between these three different parts and to suggest perhaps some ways of moving ahead uh, in research as far as this very large subject is concerned. I still feel that certain aspects of partition or of issues connected to the partition of India are under-researched. So uh, one of the benefits, as you know, of uh, uh, teaching in school, and now I teach school children as well, uh, after having taught for more than three decades at, in, the, in college and university, I teach class nine, class eight, 
uh, students at that level. And uh, what that helps me do is to look at the macroscopic in, in, in some detail. Uh, you know, a very large set of events, ideas, uh, developments, uh, which help you, I think, understand the microscopic even better. So both the macroscopic as well as a telescopic view of things, you know, what's happened to modernity, for example, from the late 18th century until now. And where do you situate things like Nazism, fascism, the partition and all this? So uh, at the postgraduate level, when you teach, you become a super specialist of sorts. And it's in a sense, you, you sometimes lose sight of, of the larger issues. So because uh, I've now been engaged in this kind of teaching, I wish in this uh, hour or so to uh, talk to you about the interrelationships between the different aspects of partition. And since I'm going to be addressing students of literature, I take that as a takeoff point for what I have to say. Uh, now, students of literature would obviously be interested, as the literatures of uh, partition themselves were, to understand mass suffering and pain by focusing on an individual protagonist or small groups, uh, small groups of ordinary people whose destinies were shaped by a big event over which they seemed to have very little control. Now, this sort of literature record, records the anguish and the ambiguities of the times and uh, the incompre well, incomprehensible choices that many people were confronted with. It registers a sense of shock and bewilderment at the scale and magnitude of the violence, at human debasement and depravity. It also speaks of hope and the ways in which people overcome adversity. So uh, this is the sort of thing that I think students of literature do when they read short stories or novels about the partition. Or if you like, uh, you know, uh, I would express the same thing uh, with the help of, say, Manto, who said that for a long time he refused to accept, and this is from Seha Hashie, Black Margins, he refused to accept the consequences of the revolution which was set off by the partition of the country. He says, I still feel the same way, but I suppose in the end, I came to accept this nightmarish reality without self-pity or despair. In the process, I tried to retrieve from this man-made sea of blood, pearls of a rare hue, by writing about the single-minded dedication with which men had killed men, about the remorse felt by some of them, about the tears shed by murderers who could not understand why they still had some human feelings left. All this and more, I put in my book, Sia Hashie. So uh, I think this is the sort of thing that literatures do and that students of literature do. And uh, this is what you seek to grasp. In order to do this, you probably look at genocidal violence and brutality of partition, and of course, forced migration. But uh, this very long event, it was a 16 month civil war, the killings, the rape, the arson, the loot had a context, and that context was the creation of Pakistan. When I say 16 months civil war, I mean that uh, the violence began on the 16th of August 1946 and continued almost unabated till uh, the day Gandhi died on the 30th of January 1948, the day he was killed. So uh, uh, now this whole business of the creation of Pakistan obviously resulted from negotiations between the British colonial state, the Congress, and the Muslim League. But also, I think, from the omissions and commissions of, the, of other political parties, such as the Unionist Party in Punjab, the Krishak Praja Party in Bengal, uh, the RSS, as well as the CPI. So uh, the tumult of 1947 and partition was, let me say in the beginning itself, a qualitatively different phenomenon than uh, communal violence. 
it was a huge tumult because it led to the creation of a new nation state. It also meant that India herself changed geographically and otherwise. And uh, this is brought out very clearly by the protagonist of Garam Hava, the famous film that MS Satyu did, Balraj Sani was the main actor, where uh, the protagonist says, communal discord happened even before 1947, but it, it had never led to the uprooting of millions from their homes. So in this sense, it was a different thing from communal riots. And this uprooting, the mass migration that happened uh, because of the ferocity of the violence, and this ferocity had uh, definitely a macro level context. So uh, this context was that there were these tortuous negotiations for independence and partition. And then there was the suddenness of partition. Because you see, uh, if you look at uh, uh, the Muslim League resolution demanding some kind of auto autonomy for uh, uh, Muslim people uh, in the subcontinent without stating that they were asking for Pakistan, without even stating the word partition, this resolution was moved only as late as 1940. So uh, unlike many others, such as anthropologists or perhaps uh, some uh, species of politi political scientists or whoever else, uh, uh, I don't know about the literature uh, professors, but uh, the historians would definitely say that the causes for partition, the end game of partition happened in just 10 years from 1937 to 1947. 37, why? Because 37 was the year when elections took place in the various provinces of India. There were 11 provinces at that time. Uh, the Congress won the election in five outright uh, and established government in seven. So from the elections, provincial elections of 1937 to independence in 1947, this is the 10 year period when the whole story unfolds. Before that, you don't have any sense of partition. And as, as I said, even as late as 1940, when the Muslim League moved a resolution demanding a degree of autonomy for the Muslim majority areas of the subcontinent, it did not mention the word partition. That resolution did not even mention the name Pakistan, right? So even in 1940, and I can go into this in great detail, even in 1940, the people who created that resolution, Sir Sikandar Hayat Khan had drafted it, huh? or Jinnah, or Liyakat, or any other leader of the Muslim, Chundrigar, whoever, right? Uh, Surabhadi in Bengal. They themselves didn't know whether partition will happen or not happen. So uh, one can, as I said, go into these negotiations in great detail. But my purpose today is not that. Uh, however, it must be noted that there's a suddenness to partition, a suddenness which Gyanendra Pandey and others have brought out in their books. Uh, and everybody knows about it. And uh, <clears throat> thirdly, a very important fact uh, related to all this is also the withdrawal of law and order. See, very often people ask teachers, what is the role of the colonial state in the partition of India, right? And sometimes I get a little irritated when students can't give me uh, details of any evidence about how the British were responsible for it, right? It is true that the British encouraged Jinnah to move such a resolution. There is some evidence of that. But I think more importantly, their role lay in the sudden withdrawal of law and order. When a certain anarchy was created, an anarchy that Penderil Moon writes very eloquently about in the book Divide and Quit. Penderil Moon was an ICS officer who quit his job and became a, a very senior administrator in Bahawalpur, in the princely state of Bahawalpur. And he would travel from Bahawalpur to Delhi during the days of the partition. And he recorded whatever he saw in his book, Divide and Quit. 
and I'll read out a little bit from that book a little later to you. But suffice it to say here that there are, there are these tortuous negotiations, there is the suddenness of partition, and there is this withdrawal of law and order, and all of this happens in 10 years. In fact, perhaps in seven rather than 10, okay? Uh, it is my contention, however, that the mass brutality of 47 arose in turn from long-term collective mentalities as well. And here I don't wish to say that the causes of partition lay in those long-term collective mentalities. See, we have to look at two different things. One, why was the country partitioned? And that, uh, as I say, is a game of the elite level politicians. It is basically a matter of negotiations between the Muslim League, the Congress, the British, the Unionists, what the Krishak Praja Party wants, what the RSS does or does not do, and so on and so forth. So why did the country get partitioned is one question, which is different from how did partition violence happen in such a big way? Why did this violence become genocidal? Why did it become so big? that we even compare it to the Holocaust, to the German Holocaust, to the European Holocaust. So when you raise the second question, there I feel, and I hope I'm very clear, I'm drawing that distinction. There I feel that certain collective mentalities become significant. Uh, the brutality that we speak of arose from the making of a certain kind of collective mentality or collective mentalities in the plural. Let me explain what I mean. Collective mentalities is a term that historians of the French Annales School first used. You know that uh, the French Annales School was established in 1929. And in the first generation of the Annals historians, there was a very vigorous partnership between uh, Fever who was a historian much moved by geography, and uh, Bloch, Mark Bloch, who uh, was fairly interested in anthropology. And the two of them came together uh, in the French academia, started a journal uh, called the Annals, uh, and they spoke, that, that very first generation spoke of the making of collective mentalities. For example, you might uh, look at the book by Bloch on the royal touch, right? Where uh, he says that uh, illiterate peasants and others believed that the touch of the king would cure them of certain diseases, right? And even when uh, they went to the king and had him touch them and it failed, they still went back because they had this mentality that they had this deep belief that this was something true okay then in the second generation you have a guy called philip aries who's written a, a very interesting history to call himself an amateur historian but he wrote a very interesting history on childhood on ideas of childhood uh, and he says that uh, in the middle ages the sense of childhood did not exist right uh, <clears throat> the age group we call children were regarded more or less like animals until the age of seven, and more or less like miniature adults after that, right? So this is a mentality at work. How do you look at children? This is not ideology. And it's more than an attitude, right? I mean, I, I, this morning when I was to give this talk, I was thinking of other cognate words that I could have used. Now, is this an attitude that, you know, children below the age of seven are animal-like? Above the age of seven are mini, mini adults, miniature adults. Is this an attitude? Is it an ideology? Is it a habit of thought? I was thinking of various ways in which I should praise it. And uh, as I was telling Sharin on the phone when she asked me, what do you mean by mentality or mentalities? I think this is a mentality. And this is more than just the mentality of an individual. It is a collective mentality. Right. So, in fact, uh, <clears throat> uh, you would probably know that a very, very learned and uh, a very reader friendly, student friendly historian called Peter Burke has written a book called The French Historical Revolution, 1928 to 1929 to 1989. 
and that was published, I think, long ago. But he has now revised it and brought it up to 2014. Yeah, it's a book on the NR school. And he's also done, along with it, several articles, uh, several other books on the cultural and social history of early modern Europe, uh, especially in popular culture and so on and so forth. But he's done a very interesting article on collective mentalities, where he says that uh, collective mentalities, the construct, the concept, the category, the idea, has a threefold emphasis. There is a stress on, uh, uh, on unspoken, unconscious assumptions, on perception, on, on what I, in my thesis that Sherina referred to, called by a different name, latent identity, on everyday practice or thought, but sometimes also on conscious and elaborated theories, unconscious thoughts and elaborated theories. And then he says, there is also in it an important sense of structure of beliefs, as well as their content, including the categories, metaphors, symbols that people use. So Peter Burke argues that in a sense, uh, the use of the category collective mentalities uh, might indeed be termed as an attempt to do a historical anthropology of ideas, right? So we will return to this concept of collective mentalities towards the end of my talk. And I'll show you exactly what I mean by uh, wanting to uh, bring this idea of collective mentalities into the research on the partition of India. Uh, let me move on from here to uh, to, to uh, one more important idea. It's an idea that I've pursued for some time and I've been arguing about it uh, uh, for a considerable length of time, in fact. Uh, all of you know that I write uh, little, although I've written on this, I've published on this, but uh, I speak, I do a lot of lectures and talks. Even today, I do a lot of talks all over the country. So I've been saying that, uh, you know, I've been raising this whole issue of is nationalism, I'm putting it very simply to students, is nationalism a good thing or a bad thing? Right? I can't put it more simply than that. Uh, and it's a very relevant question in today's India, isn't it? Yeah? So, uh, Is na nation, our nation and nationalism to be rejected because nationalism is a dark, elemental, unpredictable unpre force of primordial nature, threatening the orderly calm of civilized life? And I'm quoting Partha Chatterjee, as Partha Chatterjee would have us believe. Or is it to be accepted as a republican patriotism? This is Maurizio Verily, that defeated empires. It was nations that replaced empires, isn't it? Who threw Louis XVI out in France? It was a sense of fraternity. And what did Renan say then? He said, this is nation, he says, the daily plebiscite of the people. A daily plebiscite of the people. And this is what has led us to include the idea of fraternity in the French scheme of things in 1789, 1991, 92. And fraternity, as you know, is very much a part of the preamble of the Indian constitution as well. Liberty, equality, fraternity. Liberty, political equality, equality of opportunity, and fraternity, where you have a flat nation state based on universal adult franchise, as the Jacobins had thought they might have, and, but they didn't grant it to women, you know that. They granted it to all men above the age of 21, if I remember correctly, in 1793 or four. Uh, and French women got the vote, the right to vote, only as late as you know when? Can anyone guess? Can anyone guess? 46, that's pretty good. 
1946, right? As late as 46, the British women in 1928. We didn't have these suffragette movements in India. Please thank the Nehru's and the Ambedkar's and the Patel's and the Gandhi's, who to my mind are on one side, right? People speak of the differences between Gandhi and Ambedkar. But anyway, so the point I'm making is that uh, what is nationalism? What is a nation? Why am I making this point? Why am I raising this question? Because this whole issue of the negotiations between the Muslim League, the Congress, and the British for partition, independence and partition, ties up directly with this question. What kind of a nation should we have? Should we have a Republican patriotism? Or should we have this dark elemental force of primordial nature which threatens the orderly calm of civilized life? Right? Should we have a civic nationalism or a religious nationalism? The brutality of partition also speaks about this issue, really. Okay? Because what is the brutality of partition? The brutality of partition, in a sense, to use a broader category than even religious nationalism, is eth ethnic nationalism at its worst. Right? That is why you compare it to the Holocaust. That is why you're reminded of Hitler. Right? Whatever the Hindu right does in this country today, why are we reminded of Hitler? Because they believe in an ethnic or religious nationalism, which can be very dangerous. But on the other hand, should you do away with all kinds of nationalism? Is there no scope for patriotism? Please ask Yogendra Yadav. He's written articles on this. So have others. So has the uh, Trinamool Congress uh, uh, leader and historian. Uh, uh, sorry? Shugatu Bosch, right? Uh, look at his, the speeches he made in Parliament, and you'll see why a sense of civic nationalism is important. So, in a sense, whether you speak of the uh, <clears throat> high-level negotiations between the different political parties during partition, or of the brutality of partition, or of the collective mentalities that fanned that brutality, you are basically indirectly raising this question of what kind of nation and nationalism to have, whether to have, uh, whether, to, whether to, to use nationalism as any kind of ideology at all or not. And if we are to use it, if we are to uh, work with it, what will be the content of that nationalism? Okay, so I think this is an issue that just I wanted to flag. Now, coming to the negotiations for independence and partition, uh, how much more time do I have? I don't know. Uh, yeah. So, okay. So, uh, I don't know how much detail to give you about these negotiations. I could give you a lot of detail about each of those events, say the elections of 1937, uh, who won them. Uh, what was the vote share, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'll just be very brief. I'll say for, 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 you know, at the outset that only 10 to 12 percent of the population enjoyed the right to vote in the 1937 elections. This was based on property qualifications. Uh, the Congress did very well. It uh, achieved an absolute majority in five out of 11 provinces. It did badly in the separate electorates. Uh, in the so-called reserve constituencies for Muslims. But the Muslim League too fared poorly in these elections, uh, securing only 4.4% uh, of the Muslim vote. Because you know that uh, when partition happened, the uh, most significant uh, party in Bengal was the Krishak Praja party, and the one in the Punjab were the Unionists. So I won't say more about the elections right now, I don't know how far students of literature will be interested in uh, the details of the elections. I think not, although I would encourage them to be. But uh, then the 1940 resolution, 
Uh, I'm skipping a continuous narrative, coming to some of the only, some of the most significant uh, points in that 10-year history. Uh, the Pakistan resolution was moved on the 23rd of March, 1940. Uh, if you want, I can read out the resolution to you. Uh, but uh, so in the Q&A, if anyone wants to know what the resolution is, I'll read it out to you. It's an ambiguous re the resolution. It demands only a measure of autonomy for the Muslim majority areas of the subcontinent. And Sikandar Ayat Khan, who drafted it, he said in a, in a speech in the Punjab Assembly uh, on 1 March 1941, I'm opposed to a Pakistan that would mean Muslim Raj here and Hindu Raj elsewhere. If Pakistan means unalloyed Muslim Raj in the Punjab, I'll have nothing to do with it. So this shows that even the man who was drafting the resolution probably felt that partition may never happen. Why did he feel that? Why this ambiguous resolution? Uh, what kind of tightrope walking were they doing? These are questions that we can discuss if you're interested in them. And I can give you very firm pakka answers to all those questions, right? Then you skip a few years, the Second World War is over. After uh, it is over, there's a similar conference in 1945 uh, where the League says that any kind of negotiation for independence and partition, they will get into it only if they have an absolute right to choose the Muslim members of the Indian Central Executive Council. Jinnah is unrelenting about this and the Congress will obviously not accept it because its own president at that time was Maulana Azad. And uh, it did represent large numbers of Muslims. In the Northwest Frontier Province, which became an integral part of Pakistan, it was the Congress and the Red Shirts that would win elections invariably until this period, right? So how could the Congress accept this? And indeed, Ghaffar Khan, the leader of the Pathans in the NWFP said, uh, at this time, I'd like to have some water. Uh, so uh, he said uh, to his Congress comrades after partition that you've actually thrown us to the wolves by agreeing to the partition of India, right? So how could the Congress accept that demand of Jinnah that only the Muslim League would uh, nominate the Muslim members of the Indian Central Executive Council? Then... After that, you have the uh, 1946 elections. And usually it is the 1946 elections that are seen uh, by the Muslim leaguers and Jinnah and the various Pakistani nationalists as evidence of the fact that uh, the league now became the undisputed spokesperson of the Muslims. This is because the Muslim League won all 30 reserved constituencies in the center with 86.6% .6 of the Muslim vote and 442 out of 509 seats in the provinces. But remember that the Congress had done very well in the general constituencies, capturing 91.3% of the non-Muslim vote. Right? So... In the general constituencies, the Congress does very well. In the Muslim constituencies, the Muslim League does well. So now they say that now, of course, it's proved that we are the dominant party among Muslim voters. And we can now vindicate our claim to be the sole spokesperson of India's Muslims. But what is the catch in their argument? What is the problem with their argument? The arg problem obviously is that only about 10 to 12% of the people in the provinces were enfranchised. Whereas those who could vote for the Central Assembly were only 1% of the Indian population. Right? So, so what were they really talking about? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, now, after this, you have this cabinet mission come to India uh, in March 1946. And uh, the cabinet mission makes a certain proposal. 
about uh, what we should do with the independence of India. They suggest that no partition should happen, that in fact there should be a three-tier system instead of uh, a, a two-tiered federation. There should be a three-tiered system which where you have a weak center, a very weak center, strong provinces, and in the middle, between the provinces and the center, you have regional formations, okay? Such as the Muslim majority region of the Northwest, the Muslim majority region of the East, and Hindu majority, a Hindu majority region in, in other parts of the country. Uh, and that you have this threefold system where uh, provinces can opt out of a region as and when they want to. And the Muslim League even said that a whole region should be able to secede later after independence if it so desires. Now, uh, again, I won't go into the working of the cabinet mission plan, except to say that initially both the Congress and the Muslim League agreed to this, but their understanding of how it would work was at odds with each other. Their interpretation of the plan was very different. Uh, and therefore, it couldn't work. Uh, for example, uh, the Congress wanted that the choice of the region should be left to the states. The Muslim League didn't want that. And the Congress was obviously against any kind of secession in the future. So because they didn't agree to the way in which the plan would work, uh, it, uh, it never happened really. It wasn't put into practice. And it is only after the failure of the cabinet mission, say from mid-August 1946 onwards, that this understanding that now partition is likely to happen came into being. Okay. Uh, as some of you may know, the Muslim League said if they cannot have the sort of uh, united India with regional autonomy within India, and if they cannot have uh, a separate Pakistan, then they would declare uh, direct action against the colonial state and against the Congress. And that's what they did on the 16th of August, 1946, when the great Calcutta killings happened. And then those killings spread from one place to another. And for a whole year and four months, 16 months, we enter a period of civil war. The killings intensify after March, 1947. And it is also in March, 1947, that the Congress high command in both Bengal and Punjab accept the idea that in fact, desire that Punjab and Bengal to be divided. Because as one of the Bhadralok uh, leaders of the Congress said in Bengal, we don't want to live under the permanent tutelage of the Muslims. So uh, I've presented to you in a sketchy form as to what happened at the level of the negotiations. Uh, we can fill this in detail. We can fill this with detail if you so want. But I have other things to say. Now, one of the things that happened, as uh, all these, uh, you know, you know, by 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 uh, uh, August forty six, and in that sixteen month period when there were bloodbaths, was that especially after March nineteen forty seven, the institutions of governance collapsed. I mentioned Penderil Moon earlier divide and quit. He noted how the police failed to fire even a single shot when arson killings were taking place in Amritsar in March 1947. And it is quite clear that in this period, uh, the British officials were unwilling to take any decisions, hesitant to intervene, not maintaining any kind of law and order at all in a country where they had bombarded the 1942 movement from the air to destroy the, the national movement. So it's not as if they were incapable of doing it, right? But they just didn't take any decisions. They were packing their bags, busy preparing to quit India. And when panic-stricken people appealed for help, 
British officials asked them to contact Jinnah or Nehru or Patel or Gandhi. Now the top leadership of the Congress, uh, barring Gandhi of course, was involved in negotiations regarding independence and the Indian civil servants in the provinces in the center feared for their own life and property. And the police and the army were Hindus and Muslims in uniform or Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs in uniform, by which I mean that uh, Indian soldiers and policemen came to act more as Hindus, Muslims or Sikhs. Their professional commitment uh, could not be relied upon. So it is in this kind of a situation that the mass violence and the brutality happens. And this situation must be borne in mind. And this to my mind also tells you something about the role of the state. Okay, so the role of the state doesn't necessarily all the time lie in very actively conniving with one or the other and, and in dividing people in the literal sense in which some People think they divided us. But it lies in these sorts of things. Right? Now let them put their house in order themselves. Why should we be concerned? They've asked for it. Right? So, <clears throat> so it is in this context that the brutality happens. First, let me present to you some detail regarding the pervasive violence that characterized partition. Much of it you would know, but I think it's important to at least flag it. Several hundred thousand people were killed, innumerable women raped and abducted, millions uprooted, transformed into refugees in alien lands. Difficult to arrive at any accurate estimate of casualties, informed scholarly guesses vary from 200,000 to 500,000 people. In all probability, some 15 million had to move across hastily constructed frontiers separating India and Pakistan. You know that the Boundary Commission came up with its award only on the 17th of August, two days after independence took place. And this is very well captured in a very famous English poem by W.H. Auden called Partition, right? Which you would have read, so I'll skip reading it. It's a lovely poem. And it tells you quite a bit about how, the, how Radcliffe and others worked. Uh, <clears throat> so people didn't even know where the boundary was. Uh, you know these famous stories of uh, through oral history when people said, "Well, where will Lahore go? Where will Lahore be? You know, where will Gurdaspur be? Will it be in India or in Pakistan?" And so on and so forth. So people in Lahore were unsure as to whether they should move or not move. Okay, uh, <clears throat> but of course, move they did in the end, and uh, people were rendered homeless having suddenly lost all their immovable property, most of their movable assets, separated from many of their relatives and friends as well, torn asunder from their moorings, from their houses, fields, fortunes, childhood memories, stripped of their local or regional cultures, and forced to pick up life from scratch all over again. This is a story that many of us know. You go to Lajpat Nagar, you go to Kalkaji, you're sitting in Kalkaji, uh, you know, go to any of these places, go to the Gullies of Gobindpuri, uh, to West Delhi, most famously, and uh, everybody will tell you what I'm talking about. <clears throat> so, given all this, uh, was partition a more or less orderly constitutional arrangement, an agreed upon decision of territories and assets? Was it the sort of thing? that uh, happened here, separation of Deshbandu Evening College from Deshbandu Morning College and the creation of Ramanujan. This is partition, right? Was it this? Or was it a 16 month long civil war? And even here, even this Deshbandu Morning and Evening, there's a lot of politics to be, to be discussed, right? Uh, a lot of heart burning, even here. So imagine what will happen at the level of whole countries, right? Yeah, yeah. So 16 month long civil war, was it that? Were, were, were there organized forces on both sides? This is a question that is still under-researched. 
and I think this is important. My, my uh, hypothesis is that the front organizations of the uh, RSS, of the Akali Dal, and of the Muslim League played a role. But I think there's very little research, systematic research on this theme. And this, this is one research that should be conducted. Was it a genocide? Was it martial law? Was it, as, as Gyanendra Pandey says, a tumult, an uproar, a disturbance? People in the Punjab said, Role Pagay. You know, people talked of it as Hullard. Was it a Holocaust? Killings, rape, arson, loot on such a large scale that it reminds you of the European or the German Holocaust? Uh, it's remembered in much the same way. I mean, both are, both are remembered, right? referred to in our contemporary concerns. Partition is very much uh, an active thing even now, isn't it? In fact, uh, when I did that chapter of schools uh, in the NCRT book, uh, Shivam Widge and other journalists in, in India were very happy because they said, look, this is the first time we've seen a chapter that begins on the partition of India that begins from the year 1992 rather than somewhere in the past. Because as Suvir Kaul and others say, you know, the afterlife of partition, it's just a living issue. It's a living issue. People live it every day. They feel it every day. And it's become the stuff of political debate today. Okay? So because of this, you can compare it to the German Holocaust. In this sense, it's similar to the German Holocaust. But let us remember, that 1947-48 in India, in the subcontinent, did not witness any state-driven extermination, as was the case in Nazi Germany. And also in Nazi Germany, modern techniques and technologies were used to wipe out whole populations. This was not the case in India in 47-48. Uh, in India, this ethnic cleansing was carried out by self-styled representatives of religious communities rather than state agencies. And how these uh, religious or religio-political leaders carried it out is something that is still grossly under-researched. So this is, these are some of the general things about the brutality of the partition. Then there is, of course, the... <clears throat> gendering of the partition, which Urvashi Bhutalia and many others have accomplished, and they've done it very well. And uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, everybody here in the English department would be well acquainted with that. I, I'll be really surprised if uh, the academics here in the English department don't tell you how women suffered during the partition. That cannot be, right? So again, I'll be brief. I'll just sort of uh, talk of a few pointers. Uh, so people have written about the harrowing experiences of women, uh, how they were raped, abducted, sold, often many times over, forced to settle down to a new life in unknown circumstances, at times compelled by circumstance to marry their rapists or attackers. Deeply traumatized by all this, uh, by what they'd undergone, some began to develop family bonds in their changed circumstances, but the Indian and Pakistani governments, insensitive to the complexities of human relationships, uh, sometimes thought that they were the women were on the wrong side of the border, and they set up these uh, inquiry committees about who these women were and where they ought to be, whether they ought to be returned to Pakistan or to India, as the case may be, or not. And believing the women to be on the wrong side of the border, they now tore them away from their earlier families or locations without consulting the concerned women and therefore undermining their right to take decisions regarding their own lives. Uh, a, a few figures, about 30,000 women were recovered overall, 22,000 Muslim women in India and 800 Hindu and Sikh women in Pakistan and in an operation that lasted as late as 1954. Because if you remember, a whole ministry was set up in India called the Rehabilitation Ministry, which did many different things. 
uh, all the work related to rehabilitation, and it did this work as well. Now, as I've said here in the English department, you will obviously discuss what recovering women meant, right? For the women, as well as how notions of masculinity, honor, community came into play during this period of extreme uh, uh, violence and extreme physical and psychological danger. So I'll skip this theme. Uh, uh, you know, again, many things can be said about it and there's some very interesting arguments to make, uh, but I'll go on to conclude by presenting for you, as far as the brutality of partition is concerned, just a single experience of partition violence. And from that, I will try and deduce for you the different features of this genocide. From just one experience, you can think of so many different strands of the genocide. And this experience uh, is about, uh, I hate to use the word story because I don't know, a narrative that I collected in 92, 93, when I was in Lahore, when I was researching on a slightly separate subject, but a related subject. And that subject was the creation of religious identities in the Punjab, 1850, 1920. But you see, uh, my idea of research uh, when I was there was that we would, my wife and I would go to the archive in the morning and uh, stay there till about 12. And uh, between 12 and three, we would uh, walk uh, through the length and breadth of Lahore uh, just to get a feel of the place, to understand the city. And I dare say that I got to know the city much better than I know Delhi because I walked so much and met so many people. And in the evening, we would set aside time to meet people in any kind of people, you know, uh, from uh, the most established uh, journalists uh, and rulers of the Punjab in Pakistan to motorcycle mechanics, poets who did poetry but were unlettered, couldn't write, and uh, the poet uh, would uh, think of verse in the middle of the night and ask his son, uh, ut lick, right? Get up and write. I have some, something, some poetry in my head. So, so met all kinds of people. And uh, everybody would tell you something about the partition. You'll be amazed. Everybody. I mean, they'd, they'd be dying to talk to you. First of all, as soon as they realize that you're Indian, they would, be, they would really want to talk to you. And everybody would have a story. Almost everybody. All kinds of stories. You know, someday maybe I can do a whole talk on those stories. Honestly, I have so much material with me. You know, uh, a Rajput woman came up to me and said, Look, I'm Rajput and I'm Muslim. Now, I don't know what to, what to do, whether I should side with uh, the Rajputs uh, when Gori came in or with the incoming Muslims, because I also teach history in school. So all kinds of people would tell you stories. And this story that I'm going to read out to you, this narrative, uh, came to me from a librarian in Lahore, right? Uh, it goes like this. During my visits to the History Department Library of Punjab University, Lahore, in the winter of 1992, the librarian, Abdul Latif, a pious middle-aged man, would help me a lot. He would go out of his way, well beyond the call of duty, to provide me with relevant material meticulously keeping photocopies requested by me ready before my arrival the following morning. I found his attitude to my work so extraordinary that one day I couldn't help asking him, Latif Sahib, why do you go out of your way to help me so much? Latif Sahib glanced at his watch, grabbed his namazi topi and said, I must go for namaz right now, but I'll answer your question on my return. Stepping into his office half an hour later, he continued, Yes, your question. I, I mean, my father belonged to Jammu, a small village in Jammu district. This was a Hindu-dominated village, and Hindu ruffians of the area 
massacred the Hamlet's Muslim population in August 1947. One late afternoon, when the Hindu mob had been at its furious worst, my father discovered he was perhaps the only Muslim youth of the village left alive. He had already lost his entire family in the butchery and was looking for ways of escaping. Remembering a kind Hindu elderly lady, a neighbor, he implored her to save him by offering him shelter at her place. The lady agreed to help father, but said, son, if you hide here, they'll get both of us. This is of no use. You follow me to the spot where they've piled up the dead. You lie down there as if dead, and I'll dump a few dead bodies on you. Lie there among the dead, son, as if dead through the night, and run for your life towards Sialkot at the break of dawn tomorrow. My father agreed to the proposal. Off they went to that spot, father lay on the ground, and the old lady dumped a number of bodies on him. An hour or so later, a group of armed Hindu hoodlums appeared. One of them yelled, any life left in anybody? And the others started with their crude staffs and guns to feel for any trace of life in that heap. Somebody shouted, there's a wristwatch on the body and hit my father's fingers with the butt of his rifle. Father used to tell how difficult it was for him to keep his outstretched palm beneath the watch he was wearing so utterly still. Somehow he succeeded for a few seconds until one of them said, oh, it's only a watch, come, let's leave, it's getting dark. Fortunately for Abbaji, they left and my father lay there in that wretchedness the whole night, literally leaving, literally running for his life at the first hint of light. He did not stop until he reached Sialkot. I help you because that Hindu Mai helped my father. I'm simply returning my father's kars his debt. But I'm not a Hindu, I said. Mine is a mixed Hindu-Sikh family. It is mine is a Sikh family. My wife is Hindu. And even on my paternal and maternal side, some are Hindu, most are Sikh. Uh, I do not know what your religion is with any surety. You do not wear uncut hair and you're not a Muslim. So for me, you're a Hindu. And I do my little bit for you because a Hindu, my saved my father. See, now you can see so many things in this little narrative. And let me just, I don't have time, but let me just count them for you. For one, and I'm using bullets. So excuse me for not explaining things in detail, but I'm sure you'll understand. You have to be among the dead to be alive in this kind of a situation. Two, the thin li line between life and death itself. Three, what is it to lose your entire family in such a butchery? Four, the way in which ascribed identities become crucial during riots or other events of mass violence. I do not know who you are. Your ascribed identity is that of a Sikh or that of a Hindu. So I do my little bit for you because a Hindu Mai saved my father. So your self-identity is not important. The identity is that society ascribes to you becomes very important. Okay. Next, for some people, this idea of running away and reaching Sialkot just in the nick of time, this may trigger a feeling of patriotism. This is the place that I can belong to. This is the place where I'm safe, right? This is my own place. This is why we fought for Pakistan. And it can trigger a civic patriotism. It could, as it did in the case of this librarian, it triggered a civic patriotism. But it could, if one were of some other making, it could trigger off also an ethnic or religious kind of nationalism. And somebody might say that, that belonging is in the blood, right? And indeed, that there's a book by that title on nationalism, Michael Ignity, Blood and Belonging, that belonging is, is in the blood, that by blood we are Hindu or Muslim or whatever, or by blood we are Serbs or Croats. And Serbs and Croats who lived a very happy life. 
you know, playing a Serb chap playing uncle to some Croat nephew. Wife is Croat, husband is Serb. Then saying, no, no, no. You know, by blood we are Serbs. And there comes in the narcissism of minor difference. And it is this narcissism of minor difference that is, I think, very, very important in the making of the larger collective mentalities of, of communalism. I'll come to that in a minute's time. There is also in this story a kind of, uh, you know, embedded under the debris of the violence, as it were, a story of help and of humanity, as you can well see, even perhaps of harmony. And during the dark days of partition, there were many, many such instances when people of the other religious community helped you a lot. In fact, Kush Deva Singh, a, a, a doctor who worked in a tuberculosis hospital in Simla, wrote in detail about this. So there are, there, you know, there are memoirs of, of that kind as well. And finally, look at the way how memory is kept alive. Some might say constructed. I'd probably use the phrase kept alive, as in the case of this librarian. He lived out a memory. He literally lived it out. Because he chose to help me so much going out of his way because of a certain memory that had been irrigated from time to time in a certain sort of way. And I think a lot of the partition literature will tell you about many aspects of these eight points that I've placed before you. Now coming to the end of the talk to the idea of collective mentality and why that is important. As I have already said to you, that when I was thinking of what words to use instead of mentality, if I could use any more befitting expression, any more apt expression, I thought of attitude, I thought of ideology, and I felt that ideology is different because it presupposes a well thought out, developed uh, perspective, which mentalities may not always express. And the category mentality uh, is a better, stronger category than attitudes. It gives you a greater handle regarding why large groups create stereotypes about each other and engage in this narcissism of minor difference. And as I say, this is a better category than ideology because ideology presupposes conscious thought and developed theory. So collective mentalities is reminiscent of a category that I created in my own doctoral work, which is latent religious uh, identity. And what I would do here now is very quickly read out to you uh, something, and I'm reading this out to you because there's a kind of formalism to it. Uh, I'll read out to you some some understanding of what to me is communalism, what to me is uh, an activated religious identity, and what to me is a latent religious identity. Although in practice, all of these uh, shade off into each other. Communal communalism are not just obfuscating, but also omnibus terms employed to designate diverse phenomena ranging from, say, a sectarian riot to electoral mobilization along religious lines. Consequently, their sphere of reference and implied connotations have to be specified with regard to each particular context. The concept requires a more systematic deconstruction and polarization than is sometimes attempted. Any definition of communalism must posit antagonism between religious communities as the chief feature of the concept. Communalism then is that politicization of religious identity, 
which seeks to promote hatred and conflict. It refers to the coming together of people as a group for political action on the basis of a common religious affiliation, wherein its members consciously choose to define themselves in terms of that affiliation and identify with the interests of the group. Usually, such unity crystallizes, subsuming vast differences within the group only at certain moments when this group opposes some group, community or state perceived as the other. Community identity, with its activated and latent levels, is a related yet distinct concept with a separate semantic field. I employ this phrase, activated religious identity, to apply to a situation where individuals, social groups, or organizations may choose to accord primacy to sectarian aspects of their multifaceted identities without any self-conscious or intended antagonism towards another community. By the expression latent religious identity, and this is the most important for us in our context today, in the context of this talk, I refer to the subliminal and nebulous reception of sectarian differences by individuals or about, by small groups about the collective self and the collective other, as these are grasped from the routines of everyday life. In making heuristic statements like this, one has to sharply distinguish between different positions that lie subsumed under the general rubric communal. In reality, of course, they may shade off into each other. So the point really is that the way in which you pick up uh, ideas from everyday routines, discourses, habits of thought, and sometimes you're even involuntary about them. And it is this that leads you to create stereotypes in your head. Let me give you two examples of this kind of collective mentality. One is about stereotypes itself. Uh, you know that uh, there are India haters in Pakistan and Pakistan haters in India. And even before the partition, uh, there were stereotypes among Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs about each other. When I went to Lahore, everybody would say that, look, we were, our, our parents and grandparents in 47 were very scared of the Sikhs because in their imagination, it was the Sikhs who would attack them. So in India, uh, you come across the stereotype that Muslims are cruel, bigoted, unclean, descendants of the invaders. Hindus are kind, liberal, pure, children of the invaded. And I'm not talking, uh, you know, out of my hat or any such thing. There's work done on this. There's a journalist called R.M. Murphy. R.M. Murphy, who's worked on this. And he's also worked on stereotypes in Pakistan. Uh, he's published stuff. In Pakistan, Murphy discovered uh, people believed Muslims are fair, brave, monotheists, meat eaters, whose women dress modestly. Hindus are dark, cowardly, polytheists, vegetarians whose women dress immodestly. Right? Now, who is to tell people that the majority of Indians are non-vegetarian? That there's only one state in this country which has more vegetarians than non-vegetarians. None other, in none other is this the case. So what I'm trying to say is that many of these stereotypes, <clears throat> the myths in them, in these constructions have been systematically critiqued by scholars, but voices of hatred will not mellow. They didn't do so in 47, they don't do that even now. So stereotypes is one example of the way in which these collective mentalities express themselves in daily life. And the other example comes from my own research, which is about how Hindus and Sikhs, especially the upper caste Hindus and Sikhs of North, Central, Western India, practiced pollution taboos vis-a-vis -vis Muslims. So uh, in many cases, the wells in a village would be different for Hindus and Muslims. In some other cases, the same well would be divided into three sections, one for Hindus and Sikhs, the other for Muslims, the third for the Dalits, right? And again, I'm not saying this. 
Ibbitson is saying this, people who did the census operations in India from 1881 right up to 1941, the Brits who were census commissioners are saying this, okay? Uh, dining arrangements at weddings, schools, colleges were such that uh, you dined with each other, but you lived together separately, right? So you dined with each other in the sense that you may dine in the same large space, but there was a table out there for Hindus and a table designated Muslims here. There was a Muslim dhaba in the, and a Hindu dhaba. And as late as 1946, again, I'm not giving you detail, but if you want, I can do a two hour talk on pollution taboos alone. I've got two chapters on that. So if uh, as late as 1946, at railway stations, there was a Hindu Sikh source of money and a Muslim source of money. And uh, as the train came in, people ran along the train saying Hindu Pani, Hindu Pani, Muslim Pani, Muslim Pani. You know? And it took, it took none other than the great Mahatma Gandhi to write an article in 1946 in Harijan, where he says, for heaven's sake, please understand that religion is a personal matter. And that now, since we have Asaf Ali Sahab, in the person of Asaf Ali Sahab, we have uh, an Indian as a minister of the railways. This is one year before independence. Now, for heaven's sake, please do away with all communal cries at railway stations. These should be made unlawful, right? So uh, imagine that the British didn't do away with this practice. So this also tells you something about the role of the state. And imagine that uh, as late as 46, Nobody else took up the matter. This, to my mind, tells you something about the greatness of Gandhi. Yeah, right? So, what did these pollution taboos mean? Now, somebody may argue, and correctly so, because when I started this research, people would come to me and say, well, you know, what has this to do with communalism? Nothing. Because this is only a matter of difference. People are only asserting a difference in their eating habits, you know, in the way in which they live. This does not connote animosity. It doesn't necessarily connote conflict. So I said, yes, not necessarily, but how do you know it does or doesn't? And when does it connote difference? And when does it connote animosity? We have to research that, isn't it? We can't assume such things. So... <clears throat> I looked at many different things, including Forana tracts, pamphlets that told you how people looked at these taboos. So I agree with people who say that just by showing that they existed, you can't make much of an argument. You have to then also try and understand how people understood them at different times and what the various publicists made of them, how they were used to create certain arguments, either in favor of uh, an equimene of Hindus and Muslims while still retaining their different practices or in terms of how, because of these taboos, there is an inbuilt animosity in our relationships, right? So different arguments were made. And this brings me to this question that, yes, is this the only collective mentality at work? that people uh, are organizing their lives around these taboos. And as a result of these taboos, they're looking at each other from a sense of difference and or animosity. No, there isn't. There are other collective mentalities at work. I'd be the first one to recognize that. There is a sharing that happens in a big way between Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs. You know, think of our music, of our food, of our architecture of trade, of governance, of military warfare, 
is there an area a walk of life where hindus and muslims don't work together obviously there isn't so there is a lot of sharing as well and this is another thing that i think which should be researched again it was researched in the 1930s by tarachand and then by abid hussain who wrote the national culture of india and so on and so forth people have spoken eloquently about syncretism but they haven't problematized it they really haven't problematized it right so uh, is all of the shared culture syncretic or is it eclectic what kind of a sharing is this does it still while we share leave space for for uh fractures to happen to be created between hindus and muslims how does the sharing and the fracture both happen together and which of these is used by whom and when these are very important questions so what i'm saying is that there may be many sparks that can cause communalism or even uh, genocidal violence of the sort that you see in partition but what is the tinder that the spark uses and there may be different kinds of tinder there may be different kinds of collective mentalities at work but which comes to the fore when this is a question that i don't think people have researched adequately and my own answer i think is as follows that <clears throat> that yes okay let me let me conclude this way that there are three parts to partition there's party politics and there are these tortuous negotiations there is brutality and violence there are these mentalities collective ones of difference of narcissism of anim of ecumenical functioning of dialogue of mutual learning even the development i think of an indian national culture i will even go to that extent huh? on the other so of fellowship of fraternity so on and so forth now which of these becomes important when this is the key question my sense is that brutality and violence and discourses of the publicists that tap into fractures and fractured mentalities are able to do so when there is a critical mass that develops with respect to many factors when many factors come together in their interplay and create a critical mass in favor of communalism or sectarian violence it is at that time that publicists are able to tap into this collective mentality that we are quote a quote, quote unquote essentially different okay and then turn they try to these publicists try to turn that difference into different kinds of animosity and conflict uh <clears throat> and for purposes of doing so discourses are not enough publicity is not enough what you also need is organization no political action can happen without organization right mass political action needs organization so this is one thing that we have not any done much work on how were the riots how was the violence of partition organized and i think from the little evidence that i gathered from interviews that the front organizations of different political groups were involved in the organization of that violence so what is important to remember is that you get a conjuncture where different factors come into interplay and turn the whole situation in favor of sectarian strife and there has to be a degree of publicity and a degree of organization which should play the role of a vanguard in order to achieve this and it is this this very very crucial issue that we haven't worked on as yet thank you 
enlightening lecture and a very spartan lecture I would say on a very complex issue. Um, I would like to see what any of you have to ask any questions. So we have seen quite some ways Kashmir has become an issue for a long time. So we are having issues with the Asa and the many other states. Stop for a little bit of talk in the next few weeks. So do you think the succession can ultimately be resolved into the form of partition? Because this is where a civil court tribunal becomes uh, relevant and also problematic by the decided civil court. No, I, I don't think that, uh, I mean, it depends on which subnationalism we are talking of, right? Uh, of the subnationalisms prevalent in India today, which do you think is the strongest? I suppose the Kashmir one, right? Uh, not even the Naga one. I'm thinking of different uh, sorts of subnationalisms, and I've had some occasion to talk to Naga groups as well. Well, I think uh, that even the Kashmir one will not uh, succeed beyond a point. Uh, one of the key factors there is the uh, will be the way in which the Indian state puts down any kind of protest. Yeah. Here you see one of the key features during the forty-seven partition was that the state withdrew from a certain role. Okay. Uh, and I don't think that the Indian state will allow Kashmir to go its own way easily. So it may keep festering, but will it result in a partition? I think not. Yeah, certainly, of course. See, yeah, see, this whole idea of whether the Dalits are to be with us or not is an idea that goes back to the beginning of the 20th century. 
And uh, I don't know how many of you know this, but uh, uh, intercaste, interjati dinners were organized uh, in Central and North India by those who ran the Indian Social Reformer, a journal of that time, uh, just in order to uh, bring the clean shudra castes uh, closer to the upper castes. But I'm talking only the clean shudra castes. So that distinction was made between the unclean shudra castes and the Muslims on the one side, and all manner of Muslims, however rich and well, uh, to do. You see, you must remember that uh, uh, Ambedkar, with his PhD and dressed in a Western suit, uh, was not taken by the bullock cart chap from the railway station to the village because he was a Mahar. So uh, these sorts of dinners were organized to bring together certain types of jatis. And so this has always been a concern. Uh, because you see, the the numbers of Dalits is a fairly large number. So who, if you if you can't claim them as yours, you lose out in the number game, and that's why it was very important for the <clears throat> owners and the people who ran the Indian Social Reformer to actually start this practice. So I can well imagine that uh, in the novel there comes a time when people say, let's stop practicing these pollution taboos vis-a-vis -vis Dalits. Yes. Yes. You mean to say it'll be it'll be a memory uh, that uh, has many different elements to it? Not really. Uh, huh. Memory cannot be clear at all. The question of missing it in the memory, mm. or you know, you take a process. Because mm. it's not directly detailed. Deep and everything. Because you can be due to a trauma, you can be due to an arson, loot, everything sure. that's you know, what we spoke about. Sure, that is why that is why you know people argue that uh, one should be very careful in using that category memory, and uh, the events that have happened since forty seven, leave alone the events of forty seven itself, but many of the things that have happened since forty seven may make people remember a certain thing about forty seven in different ways. For example, the same chap may have a certain memory of 1947 and 1968 and a different, slightly different memory of 1947 in 1988. And that is because of the intervening force of events. So when we deal with things like memory and when we do the oral history of the partition, we have to be very careful about such things, certainly. And that is why, obviously, as with anything else, you have to corroborate the evidence. It must come from many different people, and it must come from many different sources, if you like. Uh, not just the oral history sources, but other sources as well. And there are ways of corroborating it. Uh, 
Yeah, I think this is a very good question and a very good comment. I entirely agree with you. Uh, the Muslim League was able to foresee such a thing. And uh, for many years, we thought that uh, uh, what they anticipated will never happen, but it has happened. And uh, I think uh, now, uh, I mean, I myself uh, have changed my position regarding these matters as the years went. So when I used to teach history here in Deshbandhu College, I had a different position from the one that I took when I taught uh, a course called Discourses of Nationalism and when I talked about the Pakistan movement at, say, Azim Premji University uh, in the you know, first and second decades of this uh, century. So obviously, uh, it is correct to say that uh, maybe they were able to anticipate a few things very well. Also, I would add that the Muslim League itself had two sorts of positions. One position was that Pakistan is a state for the regions where there is a Muslim majority. And this doesn't necessarily mean that we'll create an Islamic state. It only means for them, it only meant that we don't want the vast Hindu majority to be dominant in a united India. Because they would have been oppressive because they were already oppressive in 47 and they would have been they would become even more oppressive as the decades rolled later we wanted to create a separate state but this separate state should be a secular state right this is one position that you can deduce from what the muslim league did in 47 the other position is that because we have demanded a state for india's muslims this has to be an Islamic state. And there is a third position that Ishtiaq Ahmed takes, which I think is the correct position, which is that, yes, it is okay to say that we want to be a secular state for the Muslims, or at least the Muslim majority areas of South Asia. but. You could never be that. There was no hope for it at all. Pakistan itself would have to go the Islamic route because Jinnah campaigned for so long and so relentlessly around the two-nation theory. Right? If the Muslims are a separate nation, then how do you keep Islam out of the formal polity? It, it is impossible to do that. Ishtiaq Ahmed, who is a Pakistani, a person of Pakistani origin, living and working in Sweden, argues like this. And I think, so you're right. The Muslim League's own position can be seen in three different ways. Which is why I agree with you that, yes, they were able to anticipate that things like the eating of beef and many other, on many other questions uh would they be able to live a life and culture of their own Uh, it kind of dies for minorities in some senses, 
No, no, you see, it dies. No, no. See, there the role of the Indian state is very important, no? Or the role of whichever state. It dies for them because you have a Modi ruling the country. It didn't die for them in 47, 48, 49, 50. When, uh, when partition had happened, the memory was so fresh, but there was a Nehru ruling the country. There was a Gandhian ethos in the country. So it all depends on who controls the state and what the state does, right? That's what I. That's how I would think. And is it only the Muslim that had a <laughs> No, so it's very well known that uh, the Muslim League was not the only uh, party that had the two nation theory. Obviously. Uh, the RSS and the Muslim League were, you know, uh, people who flocked together in a sense. The RSS also had that same idea. So any idea of a religious nationalism, Hindu or Muslim, any of those ideas, or, or, or outside India too, wherever, uh, will, will be uh, an idea that rests on the notion of, you know, ethnicity, religion, religious nationalism, it'll it'll operate the same way, certainly. But what kind of uh, nationalism do you think could succeed in a country where there is this deep religious divide? No, you see, uh, for uh, see, what can place let us say religious nationalism? Is there something that is Stronger than control and yes, it can. It certainly can. And in many countries it did. In Yugoslavia it did for a long time under Tito. Nobody thought of husband as Serb and wife as Croat. Right? Or, or, or whichever. I mean, there were those seven, eight regions that Yugoslavia <laughs> got fractured into, unfortunately. So, uh, it certainly can. Uh, under Nehru, under Shastri, even under Indira Gandhi, until about 1980, uh, we lived in a very different kind of India. So I think uh, my answer would be that uh, it's not impossible to create a robust civic nationalism, which rests on the idea of unity in diversity, which respects diversity, which respects the culture and the lifestyle of different religious communities, which gives them ample space. Uh, in our own history, uh, at many different times, we've had uh, the emergence of an Indian equimene, where many different people of different, different religious backgrounds dialogued with each other, uh, held a lot of conversations and created uh, out of those conversations, a sense of a shared common polity. So that can certainly happen. It has happened in the past. It can happen again. And I think it will happen again because uh, these are, you know, cycles of 30 to 40 years. Yeah. So uh, there's right-wing populism that you see in lots of countries today, the world over. And this whole uh, desire for authenticity, you know, let's be the authentic, the authentic Indians and then authenticity is dragged into uh, religious culture and so on and so forth. Uh, this is a thought 30, 40 year cycle that we're going through. And, and, and similarly, you see the whole world uh, in a different cycle, say from 1930 to 1980 in that 50 year period where the left of the center is dominant in, in many parts of the world, right? So I think this is cyclical. It is certainly possible. Yeah. You know? I mean, a lot of political scientists, for, for instance, argue that uh, that uh, 
what the BJP has been trying to do is doctored. And uh, so each side will argue that the other construct is doctored and unreal. But these constructs keep moving every 30, 40 years, I think. No, I mean, I suppose there, there are no black and white lines between the sane and the insane, right? I mean, sane people can go insane, so-called insane people can do many sane things, and that is the sort of point he's making. That's the general point he's making. But can could it have been managed better? Uh, yes, but I don't think they had any uh, any idea of what was going to happen. Because they assumed that minorities in each place will stay there. Right? They should have anticipated violence, but I don't think they did that uh, to any great extent. Oh, I really don't know the answer. But uh, I think uh, they expected that as in the past, minorities have always been uh, living in polities with uh, uh, another majority. So that would simply continue. That was the kind of expectation they had, I think. I uh, I thought they I think they expected some of the minorities to move people who could easily move but not the others see also it's very difficult to move for an ordinary person who doesn't have the wherewithal to move so you can't expect him to move how would you expect a very poor Muslim peasant living in Gorakhpur to move to some place in Sindh. So I think they expected the elites to move, certainly. They wanted the elites to fund them as well. You know, so the uh, the Muslim businessman of Bombay City, for example, Jinnah knew could move. But uh, Jinnah felt that his own house in Bombay would remain okay. No, he. Do you know what he what he told the Indian government? Can you please arrange for a tenant for my house? <laughs> Who's sitting there will send me money to Pakistan. Yeah, I think the. I think the expectation was that uh, the elite people in all communities would choose to move and uh, become citizens of a particular country, but even they would then move from time to time 
and be in the other country whenever they wanted to. And that ordinary people, yeah, and that ordinary people wouldn't move. See, we must remember that up to about 52, 53, the border was very porous. People would go from Jammu to Sialko to play hockey there and come back. People from Amritsar would go to Lahore to see a film. People from Lahore to Amritsar, Lahore, people from Lahore would come to Amritsar to shop. So, <laughs> you know, so those sort of things were happening till about 52, 53. Even as there were no halwais left in Lahore and no bakers left in Amritsar. You know? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for that matter, Urvashi's mama who stayed behind in Pakistan. No, uh, neither the leaders of the Muslim League nor the Cong Congress people expected the ordinary people to move. That's one thing. The other thing I think is that uh, the in India, a lot of Muslims didn't move also because they felt that India would be a secular state that would look after their interests. Yeah. So Yeah. So 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 Yeah, so let me answer that question then I'll come to this one. Yeah, so so uh you see if you if you look at lots of Muslim people in India who were with the Congress, who had fought in the national movement, who uh, felt that uh, there can be no better savior than Gandhiji. You know, and this is a known fact that uh, when Gandhiji went to the camp in Purana Kila, uh, the Muslims there said, now that you've come, we're safe. You know, we'll at least gain a safe passage to Pakistan. And those of us who want to remain in India, so long as people like Gandhi and Nehru are around, they'll, their interests will be looked after. So I think this is one of the big things that the Indian state did to, to uh, explicitly say to people that we will not become another Pakistan. We will be a secular state with a, a very firm secular constitution so a lot of Muslims who, who lived here didn't want to move, right? So I think all three parties, to answer your question, the British, the Muslim League, as well as the Congress, didn't really expect too many ordinary people to move. But, but they did not. But the Indians especially so, because they felt that they will go out of their way to create a political project where there can be harmony. Let me just answer that one question. So, you see, this is a very interesting question. I'll tell you why. Because uh, when these subaltern historians began writing in 82, 83, 84, the early 80s, uh, there, is a, there is a special issue of the social scientist uh, which critiqued subaltern studies. I know this because young Turks like Sanjay Prasad, who later joined the civil service, the IAS, etc., contributed to it. And, uh, you know, they were making this point 
that the people are inherently secular and they are manipulated into communal ways by leaders. And then Dipesh Chakrabarti wrote, wrote a rejoinder to that, saying that it's wrong to argue that people are either inherently secular or inherently communal. And I think that's the right position to take. They're neither inherently secular nor inherently communal. As I said, it all depends on the, on the conjuncture of circumstances. Uh, and somebody, uh, the conjuncture of circumstances triggers it. And the critical mass falls on one side rather than the other. So there'll still be those who are very firm secularists, they'll remain secular. But those sitting on the fence will give in. No, I, no, 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 I didn't because I'll tell you what, actually. No, you see, the point is that, uh, see, it's, it's such a layered and uh, I think even Subrita's question was interesting because it, you know, she was thinking in a very layered kind of way. See, these are things that we have deeply layered. For example, let me answer this you know, by telling you a little story. And then I'll, I'll, I'll make the general point from the story. When I was there, pe Hindustan mein Babri Masjid shaheed ho gayi. Right? It was destroyed here. And I was in Lahore. And I was in a, in a kind of urban village. Munir ka mein tha mein. You know, a Munir ka equivalent, I mean. Right? I was in Gulbarg. And uh, somebody had died in our neighborhood that morning. So uh, people came out, uh, you know, into the open space in front of the houses. All the men sat there and they were reading newspapers. And they were also in a state of mourning. Huh? The women were inside singing the knots, etc. And... Uh, I had a landlady who called me and said, come here. And she said, look, they'll ask you who you are. Don't give them your name. And if they insist, say I'm Peter Sethi or something. Peter Sethi. Huh? I'm a Because there were Peter Gills around, the other sort of Alberts and so on and so forth. And, you know, John's around and sing people like, for example, John Sandhu or whoever. Hmm? Give a Christian name. So look, I can't do that. It's very difficult for me to do that. At most, I can say I'm Sethi. Sethis are Muslims also. Najam Sethi is a Muslim. So, right? And then uh, my people, my mother here was very worried what's happened to this chap. And uh, there was this funeral taking place and I went and did the namaz also uh, as and when the funeral happened and so on and so forth. Because uh, and if I sort of sidestep and don't participate in the namaz, uh, people will obviously ask me who I am. Right? So all this happened and by the time we had buried the body at five in the evening, I realized I haven't uh, talked to my mother. I haven't phoned her to say that I'm okay. So I, I told my landlady, I said, look, uh, from where can I phone my place? She said, oh, you go across. This is Jamaat Islami fellow. Uh, and uh, he'll take care of you. I said, take care. I went across, there was this, you know, low middle class house with a small frigidaire. And on the fridge, there was a map of India in saffron, all saffron. And then it said, crush India in green, you know. And I was making this phone call to my mother. <laughs> and my, the chap who owned the house, young man, 
ही सेड देखिए आप यहां पे बिल्कुल ठीक रहेंगे मैं जमात इस्लामी का लीडर हूं हमारे कल्चर में है कि आप हमारे मेहमान हैं है ना हम जिमी लोगों को प्रोटेक्ट करते हैं आपको प्रोटेक्ट करना है हमने नथिंग विल हैपन टू यू सो लॉन्ग एज आई एम इन दिस मोहल्ला सो हियर्स अ चैप विद अ मैप ऑफ इंडिया व्हिच सेज क्रश इंडिया बट ही सेज लुक टुडे यू आर आवर गेस्ट and we'll make sure that nothing happens to you no not at all not at all not at all so even what i'm what am i trying to argue that even elements that are that may be seen as communal there's another side to them right this is a very complex side to people i don't want to tell you the story of a teacher of english of this college but there is a very complex side to people so otherwise apart from this uh, we received a lot of help uh, a lot of hospitality a lot of warmth all over pakistan everywhere without fail and and yeah yeah so uh there's a very close uh, people to people connect especially if you speak urdu in punjabi that is that you relate what the stories were happening everywhere to your to your ancestry village i don't know which story you're thinking uh, of because there's my maybe you'll remember i don't <laughs> can't remember when you go there and somebody asks you where are you from and so i can cover it this oh, it's the picture and they said that you are well extremely warm very hospitable indeed there is no problem whatsoever but see again things are very layered at the same time they were very hospitable extremely hospitable oh your father was like this he was a brother to me you know such and such was your uncle this is your house this is your cousin's house this is that fellow's house let let me take you here you know let me take you to the uh, dharmsal which was a gurdwara i mean the old word for gurdwara is dharmsal you know let me take you to the dharmsal there's nobody there but let me also take you to the sikh who became muslim so all kinds of things of that kind but then they also said one chap came up to me and said in chase to do and see this is very interesting when they want to be formal when anybody wants to be formal they use a certain formal language Uh, when i went to the british high, uh, to the indian uh, to the pakistani high commission in london the chap was speaking saraiki which i could understand speaking saraiki with one of the mulazims right i could perfectly understand that so i began talking to him in my own dialect not even in standard punjabi i knew he'll understand me and i'll understand him he responded in standard punjabi until i moved to standard punjabi once i moved to standard punjabi he moved to urdu right because he wanted to establish a formal relationship with me right i was an indian citizen asking for a visa he wouldn't be talking to me in saraiki or any such thing when i moved to urdu he shifted to english and i was compelled ultimately to move to english right so uh so they did all this and then one chap came up to me in my village in the middle of all this when we were eating and said in chest urdu mai is gaon ka maulvi hu aapki koi amanat to yahan nahi reh gayi kya aap koi amanat to lene nahi aaye 
और आप आए कैसे हैं आपके पास वॉट्स वर्ड यूज नॉट वीजा आपके पास परमिट है यू नो सो दैट टेल्स यू लॉट राइट so there is of course there is this uh, shared culture there is nostalgia there is uh, a sense of all of us being from the same village and somebody who's whom they've known whose grandson has come back are sahab yahan to koi sipahi bhi banke rawalpindi chale jata to kabhi wapas gaon nahi aata aap itne dur se gaon gaon dekhne aaye wagera wagera all that was happening but at the same time अच्छा अच्छा वो आप कोई अमानत लेने तो नहीं आए सो वेन आई सेट दैट लुक आई वॉन्ट टू सी द हाउस माई एनसेस्टर्स माई ओन पीपल दे ने लेट मी इन टू दैट हाउस दे सेट साहब वो जो मालिक है ना वो बंद करके चला गया हाँ हाँ आई डोंट नो आई डोंट नो because you see this whole business of aapko amanat lene to nahi aaya had already happened yeah. you know so they doubted whether i would go in and say oh such and such thing belong to my people and i may carry a list of things right i want may want to remove something claim something and one other guy came up to me and said one one guy came up to me and said you know when all this uh, great friendship ex- exhibition of friendship was happening one chap said dekhi wo that 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 well uh, was sunk by your great grandfather and it's doing us great service even today huh and then the other chap said yes but these are the people who were our money lenders oh inhone hamara phone bhi chusa hai and this was said Ah uh-huh. ha so look at the look at the way in which people you know react ha huh. that of course they said that was the first thing they said they said aap kuch khana laaye after a while they asked me because you know four hours had passed so said aap kuch khana laaye i was that happened so no मैं तो बिलाल के साथ आया हूँ बिलाल और हम आए हैं तो खाना तो नहीं लाए तो सेड फिर आप खाएंगे क्या मैं कहा जो आप खिलाएंगे खाएंगे आप हमारा खा लेते हैं नो आप हमारा खा लेते हैं क्यों नहीं खाएंगे बड़े शौक से खाएंगे देखो जी दुनिया बदल गई no no i'll give you a very simple instance of this or what you're saying my married grandmother would travel from the house of her husband to the house of her mother on horseback you know at age what 20 and who would take her there who would travel with her a muslim servant of the family and he would go there and uh, he would be given money and gifts apart from the other people for whom gifts were sent and they had very good relations with each other my grandmother and this uh, this chacha but at the same time when they would stop when when they would stop you know on the on the way for food she would eat her food separately and he would eat his food separately and they wouldn't mind at all all right so obviously when i began my research and people said to me you know was there in these doubles there's nothing wrong with them 
This is only the accommodation of difference. Yes, at one level, it is the accommodation of difference. But at another level, can we assume that what was accommodation of difference at a certain time always remains so? If we assume that, what kind of history are we doing? Right? And it did remain so, it did not. Because these taboos were used on both sides in 1947 by the Muslim leaguers to do a certain kind of propaganda and by our people to say that this is, this is the final reason as to why we left. Caste-based nationalism. You mean a caste wants to create a nation for themselves? I don't think so. I, I see... In, I mean, I see people mm, carrying caste identities on their sleeves. Yes, that could happen. Yeah. I don't think a whole nation can come into being on the basis of caste. Actually, it's my privilege to have been here for the session, Anil, and really a very, very heartfelt uh, thanks from all of us for Professor Anil Sethi today for giving us this time, for giving us this lecture, which he said was really meant for the students, but he pitched it at a level where I think what was so important is that we connected and we related and we identified with every word that you spoke we kind of felt something through it. So I think we became very emotionally and sentimentally attached to the things that you said. And it became so relevant because I'm sure we can all uh, think of stories we have read or scenes we have seen or even people who have talked to us about this. So you really made it come alive. And also the parts of the lecture where you perhaps touched on what India is today and what we might hope for India to be, I think that sets up a series of questions, especially because so many of our students are here. I think it's very important for them. So you've really given us so much to think about. And I think uh, I can say safely on the behalf of the students that we've loved your stories and we wish that this could sort of go on. We could hear more uh, from you. Even that uh, two hour session that you said uh, it can't be done today, but I hope this is a promise that you will do it another time when you will talk to us about that. So thank you so much, Anil. This is really, really a pleasure. Welcome you back into your college and uh, to hear from you and also thank you all students who are here and also thanks to the ones who have already gone i think they had to leave because of other classes so if you could please tell them and thanks to the faculty members who are still here and of course some people have had to go again for lectures but um, yes and our principal has always been very kind in fact he even wanted us to move this into a bigger room if necessary if we thought that was important. But uh, I think this has been a wonderful morning, wonderful day for us that we have managed to connect again into this very important topic. Thank you so much, Anil. Thank you. That's so nice, Rajiv Bhargav. Okay. Well, this is, uh, this is very important for me because Rajiv taught me philosophy in the first year of college. Yeah.
you know, if I may say something, uh, I was there at the book launch of this particular book and uh, Professor Romila Thapar was there and she said something that today Anil has also told us. She said, we need these katha shalas. We need to get into dialogues, into conversations. Like, uh, you know, uh, she was, of course, talking about the Ashokan times, which actually perhaps she wasn't. She was maybe talking about something very contemporary, but not putting it into the words, but she said we need to talk to each other, to have dialogues, to actually maybe even go into parks and get together and uh, exchange ideas if we want change and if we want a new India, a better India. Right. Well, thank you. I'm, I'll just say two sentences. A, I'm much moved to be here and by everything all of you express and by the love and affection I received from all of you at Deshbandhu College. Uh, I always think that uh, Deshbandhu has gone into my own making in several ways. Uh, I'll just address your question once more. I think that's a very important question. I believe, I firmly believe that if we are able to change the nature of our state and also change who all the state will represent, what will be its social composition, then I think we can still have a fairly robust civic nationalism that gives a lot of hope to our minorities, right? I just say one thing that like Yogendra Yadav, whom you may have read, I believe that the only way to fight religious and ethnic nationalism is to talk of Republican patriotism. We should not we should not turn our backs on that category. 